Welcome to Worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation of people, of fellow travelers in all the shapes, sizes, and seasons of life. This congregation is a full of people. I'm going to let you in on a secret. This congregation is full of people who are fully mortal and human. I know. I know we just are. We just are. And in that total humanity, we strive to put love at the center of all of our efforts and aspirations. We are an intentional community gathered around our shared promise to support each other's spiritual journeys. So let us worship together all gender identities, sexual orientations, abilities, racial and ethnic identities, and politics. And may we root ourselves in the mission of this church to embrace freedom, to love abundantly, to grow in mind, body, and spirit, and to help the wholeness and the healing of the world. And as part of our recognizing our connections and our obligations to one another, we honor our relations past and present. For this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first Europeans came down the Illinois River. So we always, in worship, honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. If you are a new or recent guest, I want to thank you for joining us in person or online. So please help us get to know you. We have plenty of name tags. Please ask any and all of the questions. Our greeters and ushers are more than happy to, uh, to assist in any way. And I also invite folks who are joining us, whether you're in person or online, to stay after the service um, and join us for a little bit of conversation. If you're in person, we'll be in Fellowship Hall for coffee and treats. If you're on Zoom, we have a conversation there as well. And uh, I want to invite us, as we prepare to be present to this hour, please put your respective devices on vibrate or silent if you've not already done so. And if you at any time need one of our hearing assist devices, please feel free to ask an usher any time during the service. So I want to uh, give a little context to what we're offering today. Today is the last Sunday of April. It finishes our exploration of the theme of resistance, how that shows up in a lot of different places. And so in that spirit, we are returning to the great work of addressing racism and oppression and creating a more inclusive community here in a congregation such as this and in our larger world. Uh, and after the service today, I want to invite folks to join me in the conference room for a follow-up conversation as well. Uh, we have a couple of other announcements. Today at 5 p.m. is a ritual in honor of Beltane. This is the beginning of spring in the pagan wheel of the year. Everybody is welcome. We'll be in Fellowship Hall and enjoying the, the kind of the changeable weather of this weekend. Also, I want to point out, if you didn't already see the change of date, the new date, that this coming Friday, May 5th at 7 p.m., will be our Transgender Day of Visibility service. We had to reschedule it due to bad weather uh, last month. And so this is also a service for Trans Day of Visibility. Everybody is welcome. We'll have kind of naming and pronouns celebrated in particular. This is a community event, um, and our partners include Peoria Proud and the Affirming Faith Communities of Peoria. So I want to invite everybody to join us then. And uh, we are in the last weeks of our annual campaign to help kind of put together our pledges and uh, fundraising plans for the coming fiscal year. And in that spirit, I want to invite Jeanette Gruber up to offer a note about why she gives. Please. Maybe we'll say with a sign like this, subtlety isn't my strong suit. <laughs> I want you to know that children come in the ordinary way, and ours we nearly lost at one week. That same child we raised in this church because we came when they were five, and we were looking for a home 
bigger than ours. We all need one of those. And I would offer to you that the reason we give, the reason we're still here, we're empty nesters now. I want you to know because there's the treasure of making a new person in a new way. My photo album by Bear Flint Gruber. A little bit of editing for those who've known us a long time. My photo album, my name is the old name that we don't repeat anymore because I know better. My birthday is a certain date in the 90s. I like to climb. I like to read. I don't like a chuchum sugi, which is because I take taekwondo. My favorite colors are red, blue, and green. I am a brown belt. I don't have a pet. That was a shortcoming we fixed a little later. I am a kid and am proud of it. My address is in Illinois. My family that lives in my house is my sister Anne, my mom Jeanette, and my dad Edward. Anne is too. She is sometimes a pest. Her birthday is in a different month than mine. My mom is a CPA. My dad is a teacher who teaches chemistry at Bradley University. He's moving into my new, his new office. My mom works mostly at home, but sometimes in an office. She makes great parties for us. I didn't know that was gonna matter so much, right? We all don't know. My family has fun jumping on the jumping bed. Now, not everybody has a jumping bed at home. And this child climbed everything, including the poles in the basement of the church. Raise your hand if you remember. <laughs> right? Okay. They climbed the basketball hoop. There were all kinds of things that this child did to get higher. We now have a rocket scientist, literally, in the family. I am so grateful for the openness that this church gave us and them to learn. We learn together, and to this date, we're still learning. And I knew better than to say their old name. And they knew to say that I am a kid. Did you hear that? I am a kid at the age of nine. We didn't even know what trans was at the time. Please take your pledges seriously. We need a safe place for people to find out who they really are. Good morning. Thank you so much, Jeanette, really. As part of how we welcome each other, we offer a moment of greeting our neighbor during the service. So I invite you to say hello in the sanctuary or online. And as we are a community of consent, please ask before offering a handshake or a hug. I will bring us back with the beginning of our first hymn. And for this hymn, we're going to go right into singing it this time because it's this little light of mine. We're all going to know this one. And we'll sing through all the verses and finish with one more round of the first verse. So please greet your neighbor.
words. Welcome to this place by Reverend Kathy Ryan Starr. Welcome to this place of peace. May we find some moments of quiet contemplation. Welcome to this place of celebration. May our hearts soar with gratitude for the gift of life. Welcome to this place of sacred love. May we gently hold all that is broken here. Welcome to this place of inquiry. Here, may we be challenged to open our minds and hearts ever wider. Come into this place of community. May we together draw the circle of love and justice ever wider. Welcome to this sacred place. Come, let us worship, celebrate, grieve, and love together. And I invite Abby and Nate Price forward for our chalice lighting. Okay, 
Making Aspirations Real by Ben Soul. We light this chalice, a symbol of our faith, knowing that this morning, many others across the land, this land and uh, around the world are doing the same. For us and for our far-flung kin, it is a light of peace, of justice, and of love. But without work, these aspirations flicker out as soon as the candle is extinguished. Let us all join together to accept the challenge of doing the hard work that makes these aspirations real.
the living of our mission, that of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in all ways, and adding to the wholeness of the world, if that shows up in the many gifts that we share, our volunteering, using our particular skills. I don't know if you'd heard, but we had a tree fall yes, uh, last night at the end of uh, the auction and the dinner. And thank goodness for the members and friends who came and cleared the tree from the walk so folks could get by. So many gifts, including chainsaws, really important. Yep. We also offer our financial gifts. And in that spirit, we take up a collection every week in worship to offer the honor of the act of giving. The offering of money in service is a way to be intentional, tangible, and present in the life and work we share and keep sustaining. But what we also do, we also do, we take a portion of that financial giving and send it out into the world through our share the plate practice. Half of the undesignated offering goes to our named recipient in any given month, and half goes to the ongoing work of the church. And for April, our uh, recipient has been the Central Illinois Center for the Blind and Visually Impaired. Uh, they have been providing support and encouragement to the blind and visually impaired since 1955. Um, it really has struck me as we've been talking about inclusion and presence with one another, just how vital such a place and a service this can be. It really makes it possible for folks to, with the, with the addition of certain tools and equipment and, and help, frankly, and fellowship, that it, how much it makes people more um, able to access and simply have agency in their life. Um, so I really want to encourage folks to be thoughtful about our giving for this last Sunday of this month as we finish our uh, recipient uh, for this. Um, and also, the Center for the Blind and Visually Impair Impaired receives no government funding as well. So it's, it makes that much more of a difference that we can give. Again, half the undesignated offering goes to uh, the center and half goes to the church. If you are putting a gift in an envelope, uh, you can indicate where that gift would go, whether it's a pledge or to the um, share the plate or simply an offering. And um, what we'll do is the ushers will come forward and uh, distribute the plates during our music for meditation. And about halfway through that, we'll be lighting our candles of care and concern. So let me at this point invite the ushers to please come forward.
It is good to enter into the circle of care this moment in the time of sharing joys and sorrows that any candle or any one note is simply, uh, simply one increment, one portion of the fullness of our lives, of all that is in our hearts and on our minds. For this moment, I will take a, a start with something a little bit lighter. This coming week, for those of us who are of the Star Wars clan, it is May the 4th which speaks to the force known in Star Wars world. So may the fourth be with you. Right? And also a, no, a moment of note in the world of making um, uh, women's work more visible on May the 4th. Well, they will also celebrate Carrie Fisher, star of Star Wars, the late star of Star Wars, receiving her Hollywood star on the Walk of Fame. So, right. I want to thank everybody who participated and created uh, the silent auction that ran for the past week and the Taste of UU gathering that was last night. We had fabulous cooks, very good company, and generous gifts for the auction itself. Thank you, thank you. Thank you to everybody who assisted with removing the tree that fell across the back part walkway on the church patio. Um, I think we now have answer to the question that was posed to me this morning. Um, if a tree falls during a UU event, does anybody hear it? Well, maybe not, but we certainly saw it and took care of it, so thank you. We'll move into care and concern. We offer care and wishes for recovery to our sibling congregation, the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universalist Church down the road in Springfield. They had their auction last night as well, actually. Unfortunately, uh, a fire, I believe, started in the kitchen. Um, everybody got out safely. It was at the end of the event. Uh, a lot of smoke went through the building, so they are not able to have service and gather today as they would normally do. So let us offer our wishes that the damage is minimal and their recovery is swift. We turn to further notes of healing and recovery uh, to Sherry and Gary Campbell. Gary is starting treatment for a serious cancer, and I'll say that cards are welcome. This is a lot for them to face, so cards are welcome. We turn to mourning. We offer our heartfelt sympathy to Tom and Sandy Crow as they mourn the sudden passing of Sandy's nephew, Rusty Breitbach. Um, he was age 53 of Sandusky, Ohio. Rusty was the son of Sandy's brother, Daniel. We offer our sympathy to Tom and Sandy um, and for all in their family. In this moment, I want to offer a recognition and prayer in honor of Beltane that is this weekend and tomorrow, that part of the first spring in the wheel of the year. Creative spirit, source of life and love, we give thanks this day for the beauty and for the company of those assembled here. Thank you for the breezes of change, clearing our heads and bringing fresh ideas. May they cleanse our minds of the oppressions and isms that divide us. Thank you for the flame of hope, the heat of righteous anger, anger the warmth of compassion, and the fire of commitment. May they, may they bubble the cauldrons of transformation. Thank you for the oceans of love, rivers of connection, tears of relief, pools of serenity. May healing waters flow over us and through us and among us wearing down the sharp rocks of despair to bring joy in the morning. Thank you for the good earth beneath us, around us, within us. May we take this clay and co-create a new realm of justice and beauty. Thank you for all these and more. We accept our gifts and commit to building, sculpting, painting, singing, and dancing them to life to abundant life. So be it. 
blessed be, and amen. Now I invite Jesse Lachlan for our story for the morning. Good morning. morning. Have any of you ever made a mistake? I've made a few. Sometimes that mistake means I have to start all over. I have to rip out rows and rows of yarn on my knitting project. But sometimes that mistake means I've created something new. And maybe I kind of like it. So this story is the book of mistakes. It started with one mistake. Making the other eye even bigger was another mistake. But the glasses, those were a good idea. The elbow and the extra long neck, (laughs) those were mistakes too. But the collar, ruffled with patterns of lace and stripes, that was a good idea. And the elbow patches, They were good too. The bush was another good idea, dark and leafy, so you couldn't even see through it to the frog, cat, cow thing. Another mistake. The big spaces. Oh. The big spaces between the ground and the bottom of the girl's shoes was a little mistake too. But the roller skates, definitely not a mistake. And the girl with the really long leg looks like she was always meant to be climbing that tree. And even the ink smudges scattered across the sky look as if they could be leaves, like they always wanted to be lifted up and carried. And what about the girl? Do you see how with each mistake, she is becoming? Do you see now who she could become? I wonder what mistakes we'll all make. (laughs) I invite the kids to come with me back to Ari. Good morning. Our reading today is from Genesis 32, 22 to 32. 
The same night he got up and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 children and crossed the, the ford of Jabbok. He took them and he sent them across the stream and likewise with everything he had. Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he struck him on the hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with this man. The man said, let me go for the day is breaking. But Jacob said, I will not let you go, not unless you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then the man said, you shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with humans and you have prevailed. When Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. The second part of the reading is a slight explanation of the scripture from my colleague, the Reverend Abby Janamanchi, who talks about Jacob and points out that Jacob prevails but doesn't win, and he's wounded in the process. The stranger blesses him and names him Israel, which means one who is striven with God. That's a powerful metaphor for what we are called to be in this world as Unitarian Universalists. It calls for us to be open to the spiritual discomfort of engaging with the other, to be present in that way, and to know we will come out of that experience transformed and even renamed. Part of our spiritual task is to develop that muscle, the spiritual muscle, to be present to discomfort and pain. This is where I think we have some growing up to do. By nature, conflict diverse, we want quickly to move to the resolution phase where we can just be renamed and carry on. Here ends the reading. Will you please rise in body or spirit for our hymn number 131, Love Will Guide Us. You're welcome to turn to the music in the gray hymnal, 131. We will listen once and sing through the verses together.
please be seated. So as I begin, I want to acknowledge that this sermon and this topic is very much a midstream moment. We are in the long arc of the universe addressing racism and oppression, dismantling white supremacy. Uh, I'm doing it in myself. We are doing it in our communities. We're doing this in Unitarian Universalism. It is no surprise to anyone among the longer of the long arcs, I think is safe to say. In fact, just considering the scope of the work is a little bit breathtaking. Far, far longer than the night passing with its own slowness as Jacob wrestled with God. But there is a hope our purpose in doing this and wrestling in this moment, there is the hope of creating a more just, more compassionate existence, right? One where we are fully human in our beauty and in our potential. One where we will keep creating such worlds for our children, including a healthy, ecologically rich earth. This is no less than the beloved community of which so many have spoken, of which we are called to by Dr. Martin Luther King himself, recognizing that a beloved community is one that is far, far out in the future. It is practically like hard to truly conceive of. And yet, and yet, as much as it is in tomorrow, it also happens right here and right now in our lives. It is both way out there and way in here. It is a lot to live up to, right? Some days, mere community is daunting. Never mind beloved. <laughs> yeah, beloved. Not always feeling the love with the beloveds, right? We are so often disappointed in one another and also in ourselves, frankly. It feels that beloved community is not just not possible, but possible, but impossible. On those days, and even today, I turn to story. Story is how we have been navigating the largest questions ever since our minds started to explain the world. You have mentioned, uh, you've, I hope you've heard me mention on occasion that naming is our superpower. I think storytelling is right adjacent with that, right? As many of you know, before I was entered into ministry, I was in theater. Story is at the core of religion and theater, not an obvious, not a terribly big leap in some ways. But story, story is this entry point for the moment of our ongoing efforts to carve out and create our lives to become more inclusive, more just, more diverse. For several weeks, this spring in March and April, a small group of members and friends engaged with the book, uh, this book, in fact, Mistakes and Miracles, Congregations on the Road to Multiculturalism. It was by the Reverend Nancy Palmer Jones and Karen Lynn. This book is the result of their efforts, started in, I think, 2014, to interview and examine a number of Unitarian Universalist congregations that made intentional choices to become more racially and ethnically diverse and to figure out what happened as a result. Every one of these congregations that are profiled in here knew that this effort would include examining their own systems and culture. Every congregation involved knew they would make mistakes but exactly what those turned out to be and how to address them, that was very much an unknown and part of the exploration and very much part of the struggle. As Reverend Nancy and as Karen write, for transformation to occur, we all need stories of people who are working to dismantle this culture, this white supremacy. Stories that reveal what it takes to go against the grain. 
We need stories of people who are striving to create new ways of being together, ways that truly merit the name Beloved Community. So I want to offer a note uh, that I'm focusing on the book and, and this congregation. But if you're new to our congregation, you're visiting, consider this an effort to show our work, because that too is part of the process, mid-process as it is. Because this conversation uh, is also happening across our expanse of human experience right now in our society, in our time. So I want all of us, wherever we are in this, to take this time seriously, to take this bit of the ark and hold it and be present to it as much as we can. I so appreciate the image um, of, that's included in some of these stories uh, about wrestling, Jacob wrestling with God. Because I find, I find in that, it, maybe I don't necessarily need to give the word, you know, name to the word God, but I find it the embodiment of the deepest existential struggles that we go through. That here are, we are, each of us, ultimately, individually, in this challenge and in this struggling through the dark night and trying to save all that is important to us. There is Jacob trying to get his family and his household through from one place to the next that they may be safe and may establish their lives again. And here he is knowing that he's got to take, try to take God down. That's a little intimidating, right? And he does this. He doesn't win, but he, he stays in this fight. He stays in this fight and then asked to be named and asked, asked to be blessed and asked. It's a fascinating moment of when humanity becomes, uh, when humanity is, is kind of co, is measures up to the divine. It's fascinating, right? And humanity is saying, we are here and we are going to demand our place and our presence, even though we know we're going to come out a bit bruised on the other side. So that's the largest kind of existential arc in which we are doing this work of diversity together. But from the book, I want to share one, one particular profile, just a taste of one of these um, congregations that are documented by Reverend Nancy and by Karen. And this is the one that's probably the most known, most publicly uh, documented in our, uh, in our larger world. Um, part of what they tell, the story they tell is that of All Souls Unitarian Universalist Church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and All Souls has had the unique experience, a particular experience, of developing a relationship with a black Pentecostal church. So Unitarian Universalists, black Pentecostal. Just, wow, right? Let's just start there. Because the two ministers of the congregation's All Souls, the Reverend Marlon Lavinar and uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson, who is the minister, the head religious leader in charge of higher dimensions. Um, they were across the street from each other as congregations, and they got to know each other and develop a friendship. And in the mid-late 90s, uh, Bishop Carlton Pearson came to a spiritual awakening of looking at the struggle in Rwanda and the decimation of population and the terrible treatment of the people in that fight. And he realized that the hell that he had been preaching was not the one that comes after death, but the one that we're creating on earth. And he said, you know, we, we are all human. We are all human and we are all holy. And it's not about, we are all able to be blessed. And so we're all able to be saved. And this became his gospel of inclusion. So he came into a form of universalism that all are holy and all are made whole uh, by the divine in his case. And this got him into a lot of trouble. He started to preach 
this. And his congregation went from 5,000 to 500. And he was excluded from the other uh, Pentecostal congregations, the Black Pentecostal associations, and he was basically shunned for preaching this. If you want to know more, uh, look at the video, um, the movie that was made for this in about 2018 called Come Sunday. And it talks about what happened. But also, because of this moment, Marlon and Carlton were able to have a relationship and they made a decision, All Souls made a decision to welcome higher dimensions into the church, into All Souls. And so they were living this work of becoming more diverse with not just racial differences, but deep religious cultural differences as well. And you can see that, you could see that for a time in their worship services where they might have a humanist service, a traditional uh, Unitarian Versalist kind of service, and a contemporary worship that was very much gospel uh, in that spirit and singing and so on. It's taken years, and I've had the fortune to be close, close to it because uh, my spouse and I were living and serving in Texas along when they were doing this work. It was a gift to be able to hear about pieces of this. And I invite you, uh, this is simply a teaser of this. We'll, we can talk more about this at another time. But they were doing this work, all souls, of this historic white congregation and making all kinds of messes along the way and still are doing this work again and again. But I want to offer part of the context in which All Souls, Tulsa, and Higher Dimensions, they were coming together. Um, It's not simply that moment, that immediate moment in this, uh, you know, beginning in the the 2000s until now. But Tulsa itself has a whole other context. There's also the Tulsa Massacre in 1921, which is somewhat only relatively recently being documented and reported. In Tulsa at the time was what was called Black Wall Street. It was the most successful black community in US history. There was wealth, there was prosperity, there was culture, there was abundant life in this place. And as so often happens, under the premise of a young black man supposedly harassing a white woman, That was enough to incite a riot, and not just a riot, a massacre. The white folks went through Black Wall Street, burned it to the ground, and in the process left at least 300 black women, men, and children dead at the hands of the mob. And then it was entirely shut down and not spoken about in the white papers. It was erased or attempted to be erased from history. So all souls' work with Bishop Carlton Pearson is not simply the work of of, of their particular moment, but also the moment of history as well. Every community has its story, has its history. And this this is a community that has that as well. It's one that we are are beginning to uncover and talk about in the course of us thinking about this book and its questions. So we are beginning to say, what is our story as a congregation, as a predominantly white congregation that has been here since 1843? There's got to be some story, right? But also as um, also as a congregation that is trying to respond to our contemporary calls to action and reflection. One of the things that we are doing here uh, is we're part of the Faith Coalition for Racial Equity, which started after George Floyd's murder, when he was murdered by the police, when the black leaders in Peoria asked, where are the white churches? A number of faith communities responded, including this one, and 
and tried to make something happen over Zoom, I tell you that was painful and important. And now the body is in year three, about to enter year four, and had the chance to be part of hiring a new police chief with and bring in a diversity, equity, and inclusion perspective. But now we're also in a mushy place as a faith coalition, how we are discovering slowly while remaining committed, building trust. This is not flashy or miraculous or, or you know, kind of necessarily noteworthy or newsworthy work, but it is finding a path of how faith communities coming from vastly different traditions, vastly different structures, also how those of us who benefit from white privilege can be part of addressing racism and its impact in Peoria. There is no map, there is no plan, there is nothing that has, there's nothing to help you know, show us the way, but there is a willingness to stay at the table. And so in that willingness comes so much. That's why we keep putting different programs in front of ourselves in different adult ed programs and different conversations. The children and youth are right now working on how to be an anti-racist um, by Ibram Kendi, for example. Every conversation, every study is part of our task, not with the hope that a miracle happens, and that everything is suddenly all right and just, but that we are keep going with the work, that we don't shut that down as they did in Tulsa, right? That we keep going with the work. So I want to offer a couple of notes from our conversation with mistakes and miracles that some of us just had. One is the question that came out. What is our intention? as a congregation regarding diversity, equity, multiculturalism. What is our intention? The congregations all profiled, each came up with a specific plan, a specific hope. So I wanna offer that question. We'll find a way to get maybe put more legs to it and put more form to it, but we have to begin with the question, what is our intention? As a congregation that continues to commit to racial justice as a social action priority, what does that mean? What now? There are two lessons I want to bring out that came from our book study of Mistakes and Miracles. One is kind of the continuing nature of this effort. I think there can be a real temptation to feel like, hey, we've done all this great racial justice work in this training. Can we move on and do something else? And the answer is no, that as much as we have an idea of what beloved, beloved community is and what it looks like, it doesn't get formed in the short term. This is ongoing effort. We aim high and accept the progress made, but also we know we will fall short. It's the most important thing to do to keep pushing, to keep trying, and not to expect that we will solve everything or be completely successful even while we try. And we must keep trying. So that continuing call to the effort, that's the first lesson. Um, Reverend Nancy Jones and Karen Lynn offer a similar thought at the end of Mistakes and Miracles. Um, they say, none of us can do the work without conflict. What matters is what happens with that conflict. We witness small steps toward healing, new ways of being. Redemption may be incomplete. Heck, it will be incomplete. It may be partial in every sense, but turning to face the trouble, turning to face the trouble offers hope every time. The other takeaway from our own small group is recognizing the scale the small scale and how, what is worthy in the microcosm of being with each other, how much it makes a difference that a little bit of compassion can ripple out into this work. 
whether we perceive each other as fully human, it makes a difference. And some of us were realizing that after the pandemic, that we realized that there were so many people we didn't know. So many familiar faces, but not really actually knowing them and forcing ourselves out of the comfort zone. Like you might wait all week to go hang out with your friend at coffee hour because, you know, I'm certainly doing that too sometimes. And maybe not so much engage with the stranger or the less known. But how wonderful it is to meet and add to the depth of our community. To meet and pull people in. Inclusion as Joe Lakota pointed out in this conversation, takes intent and work. Inclusion takes intent and work. So I started out with the, the grand scope of that arc of the universe, but our path in this moment is to find the story that can make it bite-sized and personal. This isn't a flashy end, but one more moment of wrestling in this great arc. We know how high the stakes are in our society. This is not polite, nice visiting, good Midwestern nice visiting. I mean, we know that, right? This is life and death. It's ours and our neighbors. And we fight through the ages, including against ourselves, with and for all of us. The miracle in the mistakes and miracles is the rediscovery of love and connection. Reverend Nancy and Karen say, talk about what they love best, which was the making of the connections, the experience of relationship. They say it matters that we listen. Over and over, we witness this human longing to find a place of meaning making and belonging. Over and over, we witness the willingness to wrestle with the realities of a place when it falls short of its aspirations. This is our great work. This is our great story. And the great gift that we have is that we do it together. So let us go forth answering that question, what is our intention? Our intention is to keep going, to be present to live abundantly, and to keep working for that beloved community. Amen. Please join me for our closing hymn, number 1018, Come and Go With Me. Sing this song. It comes from the Negro, uh, the African-American spiritual traditions. We remember that this was first sung by Africans enslaved on this continent who called out for liberation to come, the beloved community we dream of and which is among us right now. So let us sing it in faith with the liberation for all people. We will listen once and sing through together.
When we take fire from the chalice, it does not become less, it becomes more. And so we extinguish our chalice and take its light and warmth with us, multiplying its power by all of our lives and sharing it with the world. Spirit of life, spirit of love, we have gathered under a shared banner of faith. We are born of a welcoming grace that extends and receives love. We are touched by the ways we have fallen short of who we strive to be. And here, here we are reborn, forged by a greater courage. Let us move from this place, encouraged and refreshed for the journey ahead. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin.